Oh, not quite good afternoon, but uh, welcome back, everyone. And I'll start this session with an apology. You'll note, for those eagle-eyed among you, I'm not Faisal al -Yafai. I have not rebranded myself in the break. Um, unfortunately, he, was he got caught in traffic and is running a bit late, so I apologize, but I'm going to be stepping in. But I'm really delighted to, um, to uh, chair this panel. I think, in truth, there's often quite a lot of discussion on the politics of what's happening in Libya. We often, particularly in the work that I do, look at the political economy side, but the social side of the conversation is often extremely underexplored. And I think this book offers some really rich insights into some really key dynamics uh, within Libya, and we've got a really stellar panel. So I'm really delighted to be able to uh, chair this today. I think really the panelists kind of need no introduction, but I'll do it anyway. Uh, on the far left, we have Imad Badi, uh, who is a non-resident uh, non senior fellow with the Atlantic Council, a senior analyst with the Global Initiative, and he specializes in governance, post-stabilization, hybrid security structures, and peace building. And I'm sure all of you will have seen Imad all over media. Uh, Mary, uh, just to my left, is a non-resident scholar at the Middle East Institute. She is uh, a well-renowned expert and uh, researcher and consultant specializing in the Euro Mediterranean region with a particular focus on Libya. And for all of you will know that Mary's conducted research for ICG, the United States Institute of Peace and ECFR, among others. I'm also delighted to be joined from Libya by Rima Ibrahim, who is a Libya based junior researcher, associate researcher at the Mediterranean platform at the Louise School of Government in Rome. She specializes in environmental issues, local governments, and women's rights in Libya. She's currently writing a lot about climate change on her blog. And so, uh, without further ado, um, let's make a start. So, as in the last session, uh, this is one of those meetings which is not under the rule, it's on, on the record. And what I'll try to do is curate a bit of a discussion, and I will um, spare you from my own opinions in, in this panel and just ask some questions. And so, without further ado, um, Mary, let's start with you. In the first panel, Wolfram noted that actually felt such was the key importance of the happenings in Benghazi that two chapters in the book merited inclusion. And I guess the simple question is, why is the story of Benghazi so contested? Good morning, all. Um, and to follow on what, from, uh, what uh, Tim said and what Wolfram said in the first session, um, I'm very grateful to both Virginie and, and Wolfram, the editors of this volume, for not just including two chapters on Benghazi, but also, those of you who haven't seen the book yet, uh, the cover image is a Getty image by Giles Clark showing one of the devastated neighborhoods in Benghazi in 2009. So that really gives you a, a, a sense of the extent of the physical destruction in the city as a result of the 2004-2018 war. And going back to that idea of contested narratives, some of which we heard about in the first session, I would argue that um, what happened in Benghazi between 2014 and 2018 was one of the most contested and divisive episodes in post-Gaddafi Libya. Uh, depending on how you viewed uh, the war in Benghazi, what caused the war, how that war evolved, why it lasted so long, and how that war concluded, that tended to color how you saw events on the national stage uh, in Libya. And I've been struck by how some accounts of, of how Libya tipped into civil conflict in 2014, they very often start with the elections of June 2014 and the fighting that followed uh, those elections. I would say we need to start the month before when uh, Khalifa Haftar launched his Operation Dignity in Benghazi. It's also important to remember, because I was living in Tripoli at the time, the same week that Khalifa Haftar launched his operation in Benghazi, his allies attacked the then parliament, the General National Congress in, in Tripoli. And I think we need to go back a little even further to February that year, when Khalifa Haftar gave a televised address, uh, basically in a speech where he was accused of, of attempting a coup. So this was kind of a, the longer trajectory that led to then the the fighting in Benghazi from May on. But also, I think it's really important to talk about 
what was happening in Benghazi in the run up to the launch of Operation Dignity. Because in my chapter, I first of all, the central argument of my chapter is that what happened in Benghazi between 20 and 2014 and 2018 resulted in the most significant transformation of the city um, in its modern history. It upended social and economic dynamics that had been in place for generations. Uh, we're talking about the uh, displacement of hundreds of thousands of residents of Benghazi, the dispossession of property and land, and of course, the killing of thousands of people throughout that period. So what I found interesting when I was doing the research for my chapter is I interviewed people who were from across the political spectrum, those who supported the dignity operation at the beginning and continued to support it today, or at least say it was it was a good thing. I interviewed people who initially supported the dignity operation and within a couple of years started having reservations about the conduct of that operation, started having misgivings and started having suspicions that the professed objective of that operation, which was a war and counterterrorism, that is how the operation was sold to the people of Benghazi, that this was actually a pretext for something else. <laughs> I interviewed, of course, those who uh, remained ambivalent, and there were a considerable number of people in Benghazi who remained ambivalent about the con conflict. And then, of course, those who opposed uh, or were critical of uh, Operation Dignity from the beginning, some of whom took up arms against, against Haftar and his, his allies. What I was really struck by is everybody I interviewed agreed that this had resulted in the most significant transformation of Libya, of, of, sorry, of Benghazi in its modern history. Of course, but people d disagreed over whether that was a positive or a negative thing. So I would argue that to understand post-Gaddafi Libya and its trajectory, we must understand what happened in Benghazi between 2014, 20, 2011 and 2014, and 2014 to 2018. So to go back to pre-Operation Dignity Benghazi, I had spent a lot of time uh, in Benghazi between January 2014 and May 2014. I was in Benghazi for the first weeks of, uh, of Operation Dignity. And if we go back to that professed objective of the operation, the way it was sold to the people of Benghazi, this war on counterterrorism, it's important to note that this actually gained the operation and Khalifa Haftar himself an enormous swell of popular support. And that really has to be acknowledged. Why did it get so much popular support in those early stages? Well, Benghazi for at least a year and a half, two years before uh, Operation Dignity was launched, had been plagued by violence. There were assassinations of hundreds of people, many of them uh, members of the former security forces, but there were also journalists, activists, judges who were assassinated. There were bombings uh, across Benghazi. And what was interesting was it, when you talk to people in Benghazi at that time and ask them who they thought was behind this uh, series of assassinations, series of, of bombings, people would give you different answers. So most people would say, well, we suspect it's jihadists, uh, particularly Ansar al-Sharia, a jihadist group that had emerged, uh, that had been formed by former revolutionary fighters. Its members had been accused of involvement in the 2012 attack on the US diplomatic mission in Benghazi, in which the ambassador, Christopher Stevens, and some colleagues were killed. Um, others said it's uh, former regime elements, it's criminals, this is a result of personal vendettas. So what, what really people differed on was who they attributed most blame to. But to understand the atmosphere in Benghazi at that time, the very febrile atmosphere, very emotional atmosphere in the months leading up to Operation uh, Dignity, what settled into conventional wisdom was this idea that it was jihadists or more widely Islamists who were responsible for, for the assassinations and bombings. Now, the question of who was responsible uh, still remains unanswered. It's really telling that um, if, you, if you talk to people whose relatives were assassinated during that period, they say they're still looking for justice. They feel there's been very little effort made to um, have a proper investigation or let alone uh, allow justice take its, its course. But this is the context in which Operation Dignity started in May uh, 2014. 
What I was struck by in my interviews in the, in the period running up to uh, May 2014, I was asking everybody I met in Benghazi, how does one solve a problem called Ansar al-Sharia? This was a challenge in Benghazi that unlike um, so-called Islamic State later on in, Benghazi, in, in Libya, um, which was predominantly foreign-led and foreign in its rank and file, Ansar al-Sharia was very much uh, Benghazi-born. These were sons of Benghazi, as many people would say to me. And therefore, the debate over how one should tackle the challenge posed by Ansar al-Sharia, and everybody I discussed this with in Benghazi at that time agreed this was a problem, it needed to be tackled. People disagreed over how it should be tackled. There were those who made the point that you know, the, the, the kind of wider ranks of Ansar al-Sharia were not particularly ideologically hardline, that they had to be peeled away through, uh, through dialogue, because this was a, a phenomenon with deep social roots in Benghazi. And then there were those who uh, argued that this should be tackled through force alone. Haftar's launch of uh, Operation Dignity, of course, tipped that argument, and the approach of Operation Dignity was, was force only. There were mediators in Benghazi at the time who said, if you tackle a problem like Ansar al-Sharia with force only, what you risk is radicalizing a far larger cohort and tipping Benghazi into long and vicious uh, communal conflict, which is, um, I think everybody can agree, what actually happened. Thank you so much, Mary. I think that point on mediation and the pathways, we're gonna come back to that um, shortly. Uh, Imad, bringing you in, um, so discussion there of the, the sons of Benghazi reflected in an arm, armed group. In your chapter, you've looked at the trajectories of the younger generations of youth from 2011, and you've looked at kind of pathways, militarized and non-militarized as you know, potential ways to reclaim agency for the youth through these patterns. Could you talk us through that? How do you see these patterns of mobilization of youth um, in Libya post-2011? Yeah, well, I'm happy to walk you through, through the chapter and thank you everyone for uh, joining us. This was a difficult chapter to write, both academically and personally. Uh, academically, this is a segment of society that's not really engaged with aside for a few journalistic pieces here and there not really a, a segment of society that people talk to uh, personally i'm technically a young person i uh, was part of this generation that kind of came to political consciousness post 2011 but obviously introspection is useful but you have to dissociate your your own personal opinions and biases uh, writing this this type of thing. So there was a lot of work that went into it on a personal basis and also in terms of doing interviews with people, uh, getting, gauging their, their views over time, etc. and then extrapolating trends therein. But how I went about writing the chapter and uh, analyzing these trends is essentially, and I have to preface, this is also the preface of the chapter, that this is not an exhaustive it's an attempt at initiating an analysis of, of youth in Libya and uh, the trends that affected them. But uh, there are many observable trends, trends that I think a lot of people can agree are, are pretty discernible nowadays. And, and I think pretty much a lot of people cross country would, would agree on. But uh, the chapter is essentially chronological uh, in a way where I observe youth, youth's uh, social mobilization whether it be violent mobilization or non-violent mobilization over time from 2011 onwards. Um, the irony of the revolution of 2011, perhaps for Libya, is that it was sparked by non-violent mobilization, but the heroic deed after the fact became actually violent mobilization, the narrative of a Thawra, the narrative of the revolutionaries, etc., and the sort of military ethos that, that uh, was was pretty pretty visceral within within communities in the immediate post 2011 era, and I think everyone can kind of uh, agree to that. What that masked, perhaps, is the extent to which that uh, ethos was communal and not necessarily national, uh, like the sons of Avazi, the sons of Masrata, the sons of 
XYZ town. And I think that was partly the, a little bit what I call in chapter, the darker undertow of the revolution and particularly the period post 2011 and up until 2014, where you didn't really have a relapse into conflict, but where the political situation was toxic, uh, where youth were kind of coming to political consciousness and trying to navigate this new reality uh, with a burgeoning civic space that was opening up, but a lot of barriers entering into politics, uh, for example, because not a lot of young people were catapulted into politics back then, whereas now you kind of have, you kind of see more and more young people penetrate political spaces. So that's the kind of 2011, 2014 phase that is covered in the chapter. Um, 2014 is the first widely acknowledged, I think, civil civil war, and there you no longer had the narrative of a revolution that was that you were able to sort of rationalize what was happening in the country around. Because 2011, in a way, you were either it was it was a bit of a black and white thing, despite what, what where despite as much as there was gray there. There was a lot of black and white in terms of how it was portrayed. Whereas 2014, the narratives were contested, how people felt uh, was contested. The 2011 revolution was driven predominantly by young people in terms of nonviolent mobilization and violent mobilization. But 2014 uh, built on the fractures across the political, economic, and military spheres, but also uh, the fractures socially amongst young people. So it's the first time sort of that you had this very clear communal split, uh, not, not just across the country, but even within, within communities. Malazi is obviously an example of that. Tripoli, uh, same case. And I think several, several cities across the country experience second order effects of, of that, whether it be in terms of displacement or knock on effects, the Fazan, et cetera, which is also covered, covered in the book. And from there, the picture, unfortunately, in the, in, in the chapter gets bleaker and bleaker for young people, because the underpinning narrative in my, in, in my chapter is that young people's penetration of military spheres uh, or of, of armed groups and their recruitment into armed groups, often willing, is uh, an attempt in some way, shape or form at reclaiming agency, because yes, Libya has a massive public sector. Uh, and for a lot of people, there's this narrative of stability, etc. But if you're a young 18 year old today, you've experienced half of your life in pretty much in some way, shape or form in a, in a conflict of sort. So having to navigate that reality, not just in terms of education, in terms of uh, possible displacement, commun community, even within families at times, that's already a very high social sort of tension that you have to contend with in, the, in, your, in your formative years. But then uh, when you expect to be, go to university or be employed, you're increasingly seeing that you can't access a job in the public sector. Uh, it's predominantly older people that are, uh, that, that are monopolizing the space. There's a reason why people in parliament or in the, or in the high state council are, have been there for 10 years. It's partly a generational split, right? Whereas for in, within armed groups, that barrier or those barriers, let's say, are, I will say, more lax. And that's that's both from an educational standpoint, from a requirement standpoint, but also because youth networks are, are a lot more permeable. Tim made an observation earlier saying people are not within one network. And I think that applies significantly to young people. You can be a revolutionary or you can be a protester and still have links with the other with the within within other networks and i think that's what a lot of young people capitalized on over time where you see uh, people that were in armed groups and then that transitioned into sort of a political in some way shape or form role people that were in civil society that transitioned into a a, a political role over time etc but the overall trend from 2011 onwards today is one where society is getting more and more militarized in some way, shape or form, whether it be that, whether it be overt in terms of people actively joining armed groups or uh, covert, whereby military networks are actually influencing 
politics and they're influencing economics, etc. Another another thing that was mentioned earlier is the institutions or the figures within institutions having to negotiate with armed groups, depending on the territory they, they, they control. Yeah, they negotiate not just security, but young people within those armed groups actually negotiate positions. They negotiate being diplomats. You have diplomats across the world that I've met that were part of armed groups at some, at some point in time. So there's this generational dynamic that I think is often completely unmentioned, but quite, quite um, important from my, from my perspective, whereby military networks are increasingly straddling different spheres of Libya's political uh, and, economic, and economic scene. And that will have long-term effects because 10 years from now, most of the figures that we're talking about, the HOR, HSC, even within government are probably no longer going to be relevant. I'll, I'll, we'll I'll leave see there. on that one. These guys have <laughs> annoying longevity. Um, age does not seem to be a factor in the way that we wish it was. Um, but um, let me draw, and I think we'll come back to this long, longer, the longer term impacts. I'm going to ask one more question, and then I'll upgrade our chairing uh, to Faisal, who's now here. Um, Rima, uh, welcome to Chatham House. Um, we've heard Imad talk there about uh, youth and have a particular focus on, on the militarization at some points of that answer, which in some ways has a quite predominant focus on, on male youth. Um, you wrote in your chapter that the uprising opened up a space for women's liberation in public, but then it soon changed. I wonder if you could start by telling us what that initial change was and how it started after the uprising. Tim and um, hello everyone. Um, I hope my voice is uh, clear. Perfect. I think um, during the revolution, uh, women, Libyan women have been uh, part of the uh, change since the beginning. They were uh, protesters and actually they were um, one of the, um, the main protesters who started the revolution in, in Benghazi, like the mothers of Muslim uh, were protesting and one this, this was one of the flames of this uh, revolution. So they were uh, protesters, they were um, uh, active uh, in political sphere, they were part of the um, supporting the fighters and the liber uh, rebels in, within um, the revolution in 2011. So their role was very important and uh, the, it was also celebrated. Although before 2011 this wasn't the situation, they were away from political participation, public uh, uh, sphere uh, but after um, the, the the taking down the Gaddafi regime there have been uh, voices who have been raised uh, to say to these women who have been part uh, huge part uh, during the revolution to go back to their homes or to go back to their normal uh, state of being at home and not being within this uh, change, political change. And, and this is due to the social norms that is in theory, uh, the Libyan society think that uh, there is a strict segregation between men and women uh, in the public and private spaces. Women should be in private spaces in homes and families, while men should be outside the public sphere. But this has been changing uh, more actively because women were already in the political uh, uh, sector or even in other public sectors. So but after that, voices have been um, sharing more um, due to the security situation. There was more concerns about the participation of women inside the public spheres um, and um, uh, um, seen within the, the, the first year after 2011. And uh, this has been changing uh, due to the insecurity. So day by day, women have been felt that they are uh, restricted and also restricted in the public space after the, the revolution has, been, uh, has ended. Uh, although there was attempts for them to participate in different kind of uh, fields that they haven't been participated in before, like 
work uh, and uh, political uh, institutions. So, uh, as a Libyan woman who have been, lived here in the 20s inside the conflict, uh, I was able to discuss this in, in, in my book chapter uh, through my observations on the surroundings um, of the women situation around me and my interest in the, in women's rights in Libya. So uh, I have been noticing time this um, importance of women um, participation in public sphere have been changing to, uh, I guess, 2014, when insecurity threat uh, increased. But after that, uh, the, the, it have been changed women have been taking new roles uh, in public uh, spaces. The chapter is divided into two main sections, which is uh, the public sphere and um, because uh, I have been seeing that women have been in and out of these, uh, these spheres uh, due to the either security situation, economic crisis, and uh, which is I try to discuss uh, in my book chapter in uh, uh, following these changes uh, that affected uh, the gender roles of women uh, inside the Libyan society, uh, either in positive way, or negative way. Rima, can I interrupt and ask you a question? Yes, please. Hi. So one of the things that you talk about towards the end of the essay is that you talk about the gender relations in Libya as being a kind of field of struggle. And this is the point you're making that there are some negative consequences that arose obviously from you know, these 12 years of conflict, but there were some positive consequences as well? Yes, uh, because women have been, uh, at the same time, they, their roles have been restricted uh, in the public sphere and then also in the private sphere, but they also, due to the economic uh, economic crisis, their participation uh, in the society was necessary because uh, there was a need to more uh, participation in uh, helping the family to go through the crisis uh, that uh, since uh, the economic crisis have been um, accelerated. So the roles as a... Um, uh, uh, income generators inside the society was much more important uh, than what the society think about the social norms and gender gender roles that have been affiliated uh, with women. So the positive part of this change is that women have been taking more roles uh, into uh, into the uh, uh, the sector of uh, education and work. Uh, out of necessity, uh, which I believe, not out of that enlightenment that the society have been through to see that the participation of women is more important and women's rights and work is more important than ever. Maybe this was part of it, but also it was part of the necessity of the importance of women as uh, um, uh, financial supporters for the family and the society through the crisis, uh, which I have discussed in, the, in, in my chapter. Thank you, Uma. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, apologies for my delay. I'm Faiz al -Yafai. Um We were delayed at, at well, in the traffic at Whitehall, which those of you who have tried to deal with the bureaucracy of Britain uh, will see as a metaphor, I hope so. Anyway, uh, right, <clears throat> we are going to do the questions quite shortly. So, but before we do that, I want to kind of unpack some things that I think the audience will want to get to. Uh, I wanted to talk, Mary, about this war of narratives mm. that you talked about uh, in the essay. And in particular, because you're focusing very much on Ben Ghazi, I wanted to try to understand why do you think Ben Ghazi in particular has been so contested in terms of its narratives of that period, the period you're talking about? Well, as I outlined earlier, the, the professed objective of uh, the Dignity Operation launched in May 2014 was a, a war on, um, on terrorism, a war of counterterrorism. The reality of what transpired over those four years was much more complicated than that. So the people who joined the Dignity uh, Operation launched by Khalifa Haftar had many different motivations for doing so. 
uh, very often it was, you know, I think it's important to kind of highlight the intimacy of that war. Very often it was about personal enmities, um, business rivalry, uh, tribal rivalries, but some of the kind of overarching narratives that have been used to try and explain the war from this kind of war of counterterrorism, another um, uh, narrative that has been pushed was that this was a war essentially um, between those in Benghazi who were from the, the native tribes of, of Eastern Libya and Benghazi and those who had uh, origins, family origins in, in Western Libya. But all of those narratives could be challenged because the reality was much more complicated. So, for example, on the anti Haftar side, you had people from prominent Eastern uh, tribes. You had families of Western origin in Benghazi who didn't uh, take a position on the fighting. Um, so it was far more uh, complicated. The fierce war of narratives came from the fact that, you know, the, the dignity operation the way, as I explained earlier, the way it got that public support was to cast this as a war of counterterrorism. And there were reasons why it would get a lot of public support for, for that. I interviewed Khalifa Haftar a couple of weeks into the Dignity operation, and I made the point to him that I had attended all the pro-Dignity rallies that had taken place in, in Tripoli up to that point. And I told him that I was struck by the number of people I met who told me they support the idea of the Dignity operation. Uh, meaning they want uh, extremist groups to be tackled with, um, uh, they, they wanted a proper army and police. Again, these were the kind of professed objectives of the war. But they had deep reservations over Khalifa Haftar himself, um, his own ambitions, whether this idea of a war of counterterrorism was a pretext for these uh, ambitions. And I think many of those people since have told me, well, events have kind of proved that their suspicions were, were correct. But it was really during that four years of, of, of conflict in Benghazi, it was really, it was a powerful weapon to accuse your neighbor, uh, people in other neighborhoods, et cetera, of being either a terrorist or a supporter of terrorists or a sympathizer of terrorists. This was extremely powerful. And there were media outlets um, aligned with the Dignity Camp that would openly accuse and name individuals as being terrorist sympathizers. And this would often lead to attacks on those uh, individuals' homes and properties, et cetera. So it was a very um, febrile atmosphere where just that word terrorist or terrorist sympathizer could have all kinds of, of consequences. And I think now what I'm struck by is talking to people who supported the Dignity Operation initially, started having misgivings uh, halfway through, and now when they look back, they have, many of them have told me, well, I think we were misled. Um, and they talk about how, yes, again, the professed objective of, of the operation, a war in extremist groups in, in Benghazi, that this could have and should have been tackled in a different way. Instead, what transpired was a, a bitter, vicious four-year war that, as I said earlier, upended deep-rooted social and economic uh, dynamics. Okay, um, one last thing. We'll do one question, Imad and Rima, and then we'll come to you guys in the room and on Zoom. I haven't forgotten about you. Okay, uh, social media. Imad, this was something that you talked about, and Rima, you talked about it as well. We'll come to you. But one of the things you talked about was the way, in your essay, was the way that as the war went on, the, the disinformation and conspiracy theories had a, a disproportionate effect on the youth. And that was because that was the medium that they had, they had used, first of all, to mobilize for the revolution, and then subsequently was a medium of communication. Yeah, uh, absolutely. It's part, it's part of what I tackled because obviously it's part, it's part and parcel of this social, socialization through violence, right? The militarized, and if you have now media outlets that are almost entirely dedicated to military or quasi-military developments, or in, in some cases to uh, character assassination in some way, in some way, shape or form, or certain figures, depending on where you are, generally operating from outside, but very much uh, serving a, a, a certain Libyan camps uh, narrative. And this is a, a, obviously a, a, across the board. I think it partly also relates to your, to your first question as to the war on narratives. This is a tool in that, in that kind of arsenal. What I think is important here to also take into account is, and this is something maybe people are missing, and even in relation to my chapter, 
we talk about violence as if it's this abstract thing, but it, it is wielded by and inflicted on and upon uh, people generally and wielded by predominantly young people in Libya. And this is, a, this is something that is widely acknowledged now that young people are fuel for the wars of, of old people. And even in the buyer's remorse that some people have, whether it be the Haftar operation, the 2019 uh, war on Tripoli and the conflicts and mobilization therein, for a lot of people looking at the results of that in retrospect, um, they look at the reality, and even for 2011 as well, they look at the reality of today and say, this isn't exactly what we mobilized for back then. And it would, people often joke around saying, hey, if someone came to Martyr Square and told the story of Libya uh, in 2023, telling those people that protested there, uh, where, whether in Baghazi or in Tripoli, that this is what would happen, they probably would have just went home, which is an ironic like ironic. The in Benghazi, right? The yeah, the, 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 sort of, the sort of buyer's buyer's remorse. But again, you have this machinery, this media that is there and constructing these narratives and over time i think a lot of them are collapsing uh, mm -hmm. right now but when i go back to the point i mentioned earlier about the violence being wielded for a lot of people they need to rationalize the violence around them and a simple narrative where you're fighting a terrorist or you're fighting x y the x y z person for this higher purpose is actually almost a tool for you to rationalize the use of violence against this individual as if this is legitimate Mm -hmm. Obviously, retrospect is, is kind of come, comes back and, and bites you uh, after the fact. But yeah, the, the media, media outlets won't really, won't really care about yeah. that. Okay, and Rima, about social media, when you talked in your essay about the role that social media had on gender relations, it was sort of mixed in a way because it allowed women to participate in public life, but at the same time, it allowed, it allowed a means by which people could attack them. So tell us about the effect of these digital spaces over that period of time. Yeah, so I remember through my experience as a social media user since uh, 2011, um, at the beginning, I wasn't able to use my face as profile picture because I would obviously get threatened and uh, uh, I wouldn't be, that wouldn't be acceptable for a woman to use her face in, in social media. But today, when I scroll down my Facebook uh, reels, I find that it's full of women who are out there uh, using their videos to promote their businesses and to promote their roles, like doctors and influencers, and uh, women who are, they have their own products or doing advertisements. So there's a huge change that have been going on since 2011 until now. Although I can see the, the amount of hate speech against women inside social media and the amount of threats that can uh, affect women from participating um, in, in, in the online media. And also within, within the media sector, I can see that there is enough representation or, of women inside media sector. But when it comes to individuals, especially young generations, I guess the economical crisis have been um, um, changing the women's rules to be more acceptable to see them um, looking for jobs and making their own money to support their families. So the society gets used to see women uh, uh, working on their own uh, to support their families. That, that hasn't been uh, seen before uh, uh, at the beginning of the revolution. Uh, and although that there is the effect of the hardline religious groups that I talked about in my chapter and also to the armed groups that uh, are still arresting some uh, uh, women and uh, uh, f f uh, women uh, influencers are still getting threats about their participation in online media. But I still see that uh, there is a huge participation of women uh, uh, online, and I can see them also on the streets, on the billboards with their faces on, which is different than before 2014, where when uh, politicians have been um, through the elections, they use their photos in the streets, they have been covered with like uh, you know, colors to, to remove their faces. Now they are everywhere. So there is a huge change. In it. 
online um, media, but it doesn't mean that uh, they feel safe or protected. There is still need to have like uh, 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 a legal reform to to uh, help women deal with the hate speech and deal with the uh, uh, electronic uh, crimes that are facing today. Uh, but there is a positive uh, change that's happening with the new generations of Libyan hom women who have been raised inside the, the conflict since uh, 10 years from now. Okay, thank you. Uh, now we'll move to the Q&A part. <laughs> already, already my brother has his hands up. <laughs> let me do the introduction, yeah, let me do the introduction first. So for the people in the room, um, if you can kindly raise your hand so I can see you and if you could introduce yourself and state your name and affiliation. And for those people on Zoom, you can type the questions in the Q&A chat already, already. Everybody is so enthusiastic. My brother, uh, Faith. So, yeah, type your names in the Q&A function, I'll see them. And then, again, it can help if you put your name and affiliation. One more thing, I say this at the start of every session. Those of you who have seen me moderate before will know that I say this. If the question is going on a little bit too long, or you know, if maybe there's a little bit too much biography in it, then uh, I may kind of try to drag you to the end of the question, but that isn't about me being rude. It's just in you know, just to make sure that the people on the panel get a chance to speak and as a courtesy for the audience. Okay, and I think there's a there's a microphone in the room. Yeah. Okay. All right. So let's have some hands. Since you had your hand up, yeah, please, sir. Last question, last session. So David Woods um, from the Graduate Institute. I think we had a lot of powerful things that there's a war on narratives, of narrative, sorry. There's a field of struggle over gender that the media can encourage young people to become fuel in old pe people's war. And this is very much for me a, a strong theme that Libyans seem to struggle to describe the past, the revolution in a way that is positive for them now, in a way that allows them to humanize with, it, with the other. For example, in Benghazi, to understand the suffering of other humans or to see the positive role of women during the revolution or to see that young people don't need to be militarized, they can have a different role. Are there any bright spots of commemoration where people are actually exploring the past in a positive way? And if not, how can we get there? How can we get Libyans to, to story build positively? Thank you. Hmm. Mary, do you want to start and then... So that's a, a really interesting question, because as well as the, the question of contested narratives in, in Benghazi, what we've seen since the end of the war there uh, in, in 2018 has been a revisionism of, of what actually happened. And I think that this also raises wider questions regarding reconciliation in Libya. As, as those of us who work in Libya know, the question of reconciliation in Libya contains multiple layers. Reconciliation related to what happened in Libya before 2011, what happened during the 2011 uprising itself, what happened between 2011 and 2014, 2014 and 2019, which is when we had another stage of, of the civil conflict. Um, but I think this, this question of revisionism, and specifically in Benghazi, you, it's still so contested in terms of people so bitterly disagree still on what caused the war in, that started in 2014, how and why it evolved, and why it lasted so long. You know, at the beginning of Operation Dignity, people thought this would be over after a few months, um, as, as many of them told me at, at the time. So there's such bitter disagreement over this. And as I outline in my chapter, those contested narratives have now become modes of, of identity um, based on grievances uh, uh, emerging from the war, um, but also, again, disagreements over what happened and why. And I don't see that changing anytime soon in terms of what happened in Benghazi. I think this has enormous um, uh, repercussions in terms of the general conversation on national reconciliation uh, in Libya. Benghazi, you know, we've had um, several cases of displacement uh, in Libya since 2011. The other key one being, of course, uh, the people of, of Tawarga in western Libya. But the displaced issue in Benghazi has been by far the biggest issue, the biggest displacement issue. And it is rooted in, you know, the, the displaced of Benghazi were not merely those people who had to leave their neighborhoods because there was fighting in the neighborhoods. Most of the displaced in Benghazi were people who were driven out of their homes because of real or perceived uh, political affiliations or how they actually viewed 
the, the, the war on Operation Dignity. And so I think in terms of solving the, the challenge of the displaced in Benghazi, and I think this is one of the reasons why it really hasn't been a priority for internationals, um, is that it raises all kinds of difficult questions about what really happened in Benghazi over those four years. And speaking of revisionism in terms of the Benghazi war, I've been struck by the fact that if you look at how the war is commemorated in Benghazi by the, the, the dispensation in Benghazi, they place more emphasis on uh, October 2014 rather than the starting date of Operation Dignity, which was May 2014. And in some cases, some people have tried to say that Operation Dignity actually began in October 2014, which was uh, a time when uh, Haftar started arming uh, neighborhood units, etc., and there was a, a greater push between May and October of 2014. Uh, Operation Dignity was actually struggling in, in Benghazi and had experienced several losses. So that's just one example of the kind of revisionism that has been happening around the war uh, in Benghazi uh, and wider conversations that, of course, justifies particular uh, interests at this present moment. Imad, do you want to come in on that? Yeah, uncharacteristically of me, I'll try and be a little bit positive on uh, this, this, this point. I relate this to the previous session, right? Um, yes, there are a lot of grievances. The reconciliation processes, the formal ones, are a complete joke, uh, to, to be honest with you, especially the contemporary one, at least the, the artificial meetings, etc., are no, no platform for reconciliation. But to, to put matters into perspective, what we talked about in the session earlier was this process of elite consolidation. And combine that with the complete collapse of a lot of the narratives that were sustained over the past few conflicts. And you see buyer's remorse, you see the narrative of stability not really uh, being well kind of warranted or, or proved by, by anything at, at, at this stage. I think what why people why there isn't a lot of urgency to deal with this and why a lot of people are not uh, why a lot of young people particularly are not non-violently mobilizing or, or talking to each other etc is partly because of oil prices ironically there's enough at this stage money to go around for things to remain relatively calm my personal opinion is that if the oil barrel price would drop tomorrow by 20 bucks, this entire narrative of stability that the GNU has built would actually collapse because they would no longer be able to sustain a lot of uh, this elite consolidation process, essentially. And that will lead to a lot of popular frustration. Now, what form that will take and whether that is in, in, by any means a recon reconciliation per se, I don't know. But in terms of young people, you already see a lot of informal uh, in, through informal means them communicating to each other. And this applies to the Benghazi war. There were some nascent burgeoning efforts to talk about that on platforms like Clubhouse, etc. Then you have the issue of uh, security forces monitoring you, etc. And uh, the, the kind of more extreme voices taking over. But it applies, it applies a, across the board. So the flip side to the process of elite consolidation, essentially, that you have right now is that it's actually unifying the young people that were pretty much uh, whose, whose kind of social links were, were dislocated because of the conflict. So that's, that's I think, one ironically uh, inadvertent byproduct of this, of this process, with, which I think is a, is a positive if it's appropriately built on. And to relate it earlier to the mediation and your question about the international mediation processes, I think this international frustration should be built upon. If people burn the parliament, the HOR, you shouldn't be blaming the protester. You should probably be blaming the people that have been there for 10 years and plan on there being there for 10 more. To just briefly come in on that, um, you know, in, in recent months, there has been, as part of the understanding, let's just say, between the camp of Abdul Hamid Debeba and the camp of Khalifa Haftar, uh, part of the conversations that are happening as a result of that understanding relates to the Benghazi displaced. Um, so there have been some signs from the Haftar camp and Debeba camp that they want some move forward on this. The displaced I've spoken to about this are extremely skeptical, believe that both sides are looking at this issue in terms of how they can gain from it politically. And as uh, several displaced uh, made the argument to me, they said, well, we will not return home until 
we have security guarantees and and they have made the case that they've made the argument then that basically they believe actually Khalifa Haftar cannot give those guarantees the 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 situation in Benghazi is is complicated in that respect so while yes it's true this this kind of process of what some might say is a, a process of elite reconciliation has changed some uh, aspects of the wider conversation um, when it comes to the Benghazi issue because this war divided neighborhoods, communities, families, inside immediate families, there were bitter divisions over this war. And that makes it so much more difficult to address. Okay, let's come back to the audience. Questions? Yes, here and there. We'll take two and then the panel can choose to answer both. Uh, hi, my name is Fatima and I work at Internews, a media development organization. My question to both of you is um, on the role of civil society and media outlets also, given the recent crackdown that uh, has been happening since like 2020, um, how do you see uh, the role of uh, civil society and also media platforms in filling that gap that Imad mentioned about uh, how youth are finding like that gap of uh, when they graduate, uh, that they can't access, for example, the public sector, and um, it's easier, for example, to join uh, military, military or militia forces. So, but in general, also, how do you see the role of civil society and media outlets? Thank you. Okay, and then your questions. Hi everyone, thank you for the panel. Uh, my name is Mohammed Abdullah. I work for SRM, a uh, corporate diligence company. So my question is coming from Tripoli, from a disadvantaged background, kind of in Western. I'm going to, to speak up a little bit, sorry. Yeah, uh, coming from a disadvantaged background in Tripoli, the trend I see within the young people, it says, uh, because of this privatization <coughs> going on, is they call it as a militia money. They say, if you don't want to be involved in the militia money, you either take the sea route or struggle in silence. Would you consider this new privatization going on or the economic awareness? Um, how does it affect the social status within young people who are like working class or does it, because they don't have access to that, same as other people from other backgrounds? Very interesting. Imad, do you want to come in on that first and then we'll go to the civil society question? Correct. I want to understand your question well. So you're talking about the economically disadvantaged because they don't have access to militia money. How does that affect their choices? Is that what you are asking? The new privatization that is going on, the new entrepreneurship is more increasing. I think the concept of an entrepreneur in Libya is a weird one, uh, to be completely honest with you, because there's it's vastly different. You could consider a very prolific businessman that benefits from letters of credit through relationships with particular state institutions or state officials as an entrepreneur. And you could consider someone bootstrapping and try to crowdfund through his local neighborhood or local jamaia an entrepreneur. And these are very different models of entrepreneurship. Um, now, yeah, obviously, the, the first one has relationships that will probably uh, that he, he intends to leverage and he, he is le le leveraging whereas for the second one i think the choices are increasingly less so the the argument about the the sea route the migration etc that's partly tackled within that's partly tackled within within my chapter as well although obviously i didn't mention it there's a rise in there's a rise in young warlords in libya a new generation of 20 20 year olds, even younger at times in, in certain, um, certain areas that are have built a fortune off of actually it either it, it, in generally illicit businesses, uh, basically. Uh, and the pull factor because of the permeability of the networks of those people is that a lot of the people from economically disadvantaged backgrounds can then go and do that. Uh, instead, because it not just fast tracks you from a live, that's why I mentioned that it, it's actually a means of reclaiming agency. It not only is can possibly enrich you financially, but for for some people at least, it also fast tracks yeah, kind of in, in some ways your employment. It can fast track your approach if you intend to have a political career or even fast track you into a uh, position within a financial or economic institution or position within the foreign ministry. 
So the social, the social divide that current, currently exists is still very much there. And I think a lot of the people that were in the middle class are a lot poorer, but equally the, because of the penetration of the militarized sphere, it's actually allowing some form of mobility there at the cost of a lot of the social and cultural mores within, within society writ large. Mary, this is something that you explored slightly in the essay about the change in economic status among different groups and people moving into areas that previously they hadn't been in. I think that speaks to your question, Mohammed, about the change in the way that, I mean, the fragmentation of Libya has meant that there have been certain challenges, of course, on certain sectors, like, for example, what we might call the working class. But equally, there have been these opportunities, some of which you've discussed, but some of which were evident in Benghazi. Well, I think Benghazi is, is a specific case in that, yes, in my chapter, I have three case studies um, based on three areas of, of Benghazi and how uh, those three areas were affected by the, the war. Uh, so Lathi, uh, traditionally a, a working class, low income, predominantly low income uh, neighborhood in Benghazi, um, Al-Fuihat, a more affluent uh, neighborhood in Benghazi. And then the three adjoining neighborhoods of Garyuna, Squarsha, and uh, Gonfuda on the western outskirts of, of Benghazi. And all of those neighborhoods experienced the, the war in different ways. But what I found fascinating was just how many people in those neighborhoods I interviewed, and then in Benghazi more widely, again, talking about the demographic changes in Benghazi, because this simply wasn't just a case of displacement from you know, people being driven out of Benghazi. But what happened, particularly after the war ended, was people moved into Benghazi from other parts of Eastern Libya. And these were people who were perceived to be, of course, allied with the victors of, of the war. Um, and what's, what's fascinating is all the stories about inside neighborhoods, and again, it goes back to that point of the intimacy of what happened in Benghazi, where you have people now saying, we don't know our neighbors, we used to have a good community spirit in, in our neighborhood. And, and, and also a socioeconomic aspect of this where some of the new arrivals are very often deemed as, um, you know, people who are, you know, less well educated from marginal parts of Eastern Libya, et cetera. So there are all kinds of, um, there's kind of a, snow, a social snobbery to, to some of the, of what I was hearing from some of my interviewees. And that's really interesting, but I would like to uh, address the, the question on civil society, which I think is a really important question. Um, those of you who know Libya know that uh, right across Libya, civil society is under more pressure than ever before, at least since 2011. Um, and some of the characteristics of this pressure and this kind of shrinking of the civil society space uh, are similar, whether it's in Eastern Libya or Western Libya. Um, in, in recent years, we've seen um, brief kind of outbursts of youth-driven protest movements across the country, challenging the status quo in Tripoli, challenging the status quo and in, in Eastern Libya. So those status quo actors know that there is a, a kind of a frustration, you know, a resentment bubbling, and, and they fear it. And uh, as a result, uh, we, we're seeing this kind of repression or shrinking of the civil society space. Um, in Benghazi, it's particularly pronounced. Um, I've been, you know, struck by the number of people who, um, again, were civil society activists and actors, etc., who initially supported Operation Dignity in 2014 because, you know, their friends had been assassinated, re relatives, etc., and many of them are now out of Benghazi and feel they it's impossible for them to, to live in Benghazi. Also in Benghazi, and this dynamic is also present in, in Tripoli and other parts of Libya, you have um, the, the, the kind of taking over of the religious space by the so-called Mudkali Salafis. And what happened in Benghazi is that Haftar recruited these Mudkali Salafis into his fighting forces and empowered them to a degree that they essentially took over the religious space in, in the city. And this then led to them trying to project or impose ultra conservative uh, social norms on the city. And some of that was, was about basically trying to dampen down civil society um, activity. So there's quite a, a mix of, of kind of dynamics and factors that have fed into this ever uh, shrinking civil society space in Benghazi, but also in, in Western Libya. Uh, Rima, I think you missed the question, but can I bring you in on it? It was about what is the role of media outlets and civil society in today's Libya? I think that was how it was, yeah. 
sorry, uh, I lost connection. Um, so um, uh, what's the role of the Libyan media? Uh, the media outlets and broader civil society. Well, today uh, I also um, share uh, Mary's uh, view on that, that it's, uh, the civil society uh, is uh, shrinking um, during the, the last two years. And I think there is a, also a pressure on uh, the organizations that work on uh, um, gender um, based violence against women. Uh, there have been uh, some protesters uh, last year, as I remember, who uh, refuse uh, to to take these kind of uh, uh, to, to, to refuse the decisions made uh, towards more legal frameworks uh, to to protect women from gender based violence. Uh, although I think that um, within the Libyan society we can see that women are have been affected uh, uh, by violence under the umbrella of the general violence that's affecting Libya. And there is more need to, to, to media and civil society organization to work towards this, um, uh, this topic. And uh, the, the, the financial um, uh, situation, financial roles of women um, and, and, and economical uh, empowerment have taken some uh, role in protecting some women from uh, being affected by uh, gender-based violence, but I think it's still needed uh, and more than ever to, to have more organizations working towards this issue. And uh, as long as it's shrinking and uh, the civil society environment is not very safe and stable, this will increase the, the society's uh, um, uh, look to, to the importance of fighting uh, gender-based violence. And uh, I think that um, media and civil society role is uh, important to, uh, to, to, to address this issue. And uh, as long as we lack its positive role day by day, it will affect negatively um, the situation of women uh, in Libya, although uh, we can see uh, positive changes in their roles, but there is also insecurity that affects their situation and there is still a need uh, uh, for protection from other parts of groups who are not very familiar with this um, with the concept of gender-based violence and they think that protecting women uh, from insecurity should be looking at them as um, uh, uh, people who should stay inside homes and inside private spheres and uh, to take away the advantages that they have been um, uh, taken through the economic crisis and the, 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 the conflict in general. Thank you, Imad. Um, Imad, I want, there's a question directly for you, so perhaps you can leave the civil society question for the moment and answer this one from uh, Faith Mabera. She's a PhD candidate at the University of Pretoria working on the theme of stabilization in post-intervention Libya. So the question is, what are the implications of the ad hoc approach by international actors and local actors towards hybrid security orders across various contexts? She's thinking about Libya, Lebanon, Syria, Yemen, other places. Briefly, if you... <laughs> areas of speciality so we can no, no for sure okay I mean in terms of in terms of implications obviously if you're cutting a deal with an armed group that got into people smuggling because you want to alt the arrival of migrants that's not exactly the way to go is it and the policy the policy solutions are are there and there's a lot of literature on the negative implications of that doesn't mean doing completely away with hybrid security arrangements or not engaging with non-state actors. But I think there's a, so for instance, let's take, since we're talking about Libya, let's take how the UN is, is currently engaging in, it, in its work. I think the UN is oddly, from my perspective, engaging like a, almost a humanitarian actor uh, at this stage where it doesn't place any conditionalities on who it's engaging with. Uh, you're actively seeing people that yesterday were, were cracking down on civil society, arresting people, broadcasting uh, activists being arrested on their Facebook pages, shelling people, etc., that are 
sitting down with with the SRSG and having Bazin. That's not a good look for for the UN to have, and that's not a good look for its credibility. It's not a way to conduct a military track meant to reform the security sector. There's supposed to be conditionalities on the engagement of of armed actors, uh, conditionalities placed on their behavior, on their uh, on how they conduct their military operations, uh, and even from my perspective, the whole whole discussion around economic reforms uh, related to the defense and security sector in Libya, because a lot of the armed groups have managed to find workarounds to, to get uh, almost substantial amount of funding without any oversight. So I think basically if I were to make a policy recommendations on this front, it's, it, it's yeah, okay, engage with them, but engage with them in, with conditionalities and probably with a long-term goal in, goal in mind. I hope that answers your question, Faith, if you're watching it. Okay, good. Uh, audience, tell me, who else? Over here and there at the back, yeah. Let's do two. Hi, uh, Chris Thorne from the Center for Humanitarian Dialogue. Um, my question's for Mary, but uh, Emad might have some thoughts on this too. Um, I'm wondering if you can speak a little bit about the international engagement in the war in, in Benghazi and uh, how you think the international support uh, for both sides uh, affected the... Um, trajectory of the of the war in Benghazi and then uh, maybe more broadly how you feel that that um, engagement in the in the in the Benghazi conflict um, affected the LPA negotiations that were going on at the same time in in Skirat so. thank you and there's the yeah, gentleman over there oh <clears throat> thank you uh, Juma El Gamati from Libya. Uh, in fact, my question, more or less, uh, Chris beat me to it, but I'll just add a little bit more. Uh, the theme is violence and transformation, social, economic, political. However, one factor that has not been alluded to yet in the first panel and, and now, and that is the role of external players, mainly regional countries and international players in Libya over the last 12 years through this uh, turbulent transition. As we know, there are at least nine countries heavily involved in Libya because we have that mechanism of three plus two plus two plus two who meet regularly, uh, supposedly to decide the trajectory of the political process in Libya. My question is, have these players, these international or regional interference in Libya, have they been conducive or detrimental to uh, 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 stabilizing Libya? Have they actually fueled the violence, or at least some of them between 20, 2014 to 2020, the first war and the second war? Uh, or, or have they tried to uh, maintain peace? Uh, is the strategy still uh, conflict containment, or is it conflict resolution? And I'll end up with one example of violent intervention. In, two, in April 2016, a French helicopter uh, fell down in the west of Benghazi, killing two French soldiers. President Hollande came out and admitted publicly this. And in 2019, in my own city, Garian, we, uh, they were found sophisticated javelin missiles, which when the Americans traced the serial numbers, they said they have been supplied to French army a few years before. So okay. have the... Have the external interference in Libya been conducive to violence, uh, I mean, to stability and to, to uh, uh, reaching accord and ending this turbulent violence, okay. or has it been detrimental? Thank you for Thank the question. Thank you very much. Uh, Mary, what, I mean, they're actually very similar questions about external actors. Do you want to start with the, the question about the international engagement in Benghazi and then broaden it out to actors? So the, the four years of, of fighting in, in Benghazi, on both sides you had uh, support from external actors. Um, and there have been several UN panel of experts on Libya reports that have documented this on the Khalifa Haftar and, and Operation Dignity side. His chief benefactors at that point were the United Arab Emirates, Egypt. Uh, Jamal Gamati just mentioned that the there were French special forces on the ground working with uh, with Haftar's forces at, at one point as, as well. And then on the um, anti-dignity side, you had links with Qatar, with uh, Turkey. So there is a school of thought in terms of the four year war in Benghazi. And going back to what I said earlier, there were people at the beginning of the dignity operation that 
thought it would be over in a, in a matter of months, which I think was, was naive. However, there is a school of thought that holds that if there hadn't been the level of external um, involvement in the war in Benghazi, that actually the war in Benghazi would not have lasted so long. And I mentioned earlier the, the kind of revisionism in terms of how the beginning of the dignity operation is commemorated in Benghazi and how many people now commemorate it as beginning in October, a time when, you know, it was clear that the dignity operation had suddenly got a, an, an injection, if you like, of, of weaponry, et cetera, and, and ammunition, allowing them to arm these neighborhood uh, movement, uh, units, rather, whereas before they had been struggling uh, with, with their operations. So there's no doubt that the, the international involvement within um, Benghazi in terms of the war, but also I would point out that, again, going back to that question of, of the displaced, um, you know, before Haftar launched his, um, his offensive to capture Tripoli from the internationally recognized government in 2009, uh, there was very much this kind of international pu push to, to forge a deal and to forge a deal with Haftar. And there was very much a sense in, in various international quarters People would tell you at that time, oh, you know, Haftar's going to win, Haftar's going to win. And people would have argued that at the beginning of his offensive as well, and right up to the point when there was Turkish intervention at the uh, request of, of the government in Tripoli, which of course countered uh, Haftar's offensive. Um, and the displaced issue and the question of what had happened in Benghazi and what was continuing to happen in Benghazi was really not on, on the priority list at that time. And many of the, the displaced I spoke to in the period leading up to 2009 regularly complained about the fact that it was clear this didn't matter. As far as many internationals were concerned, the Benghazi story was done and dusted. There was no point revisiting. Uh, there's certainly no point opening up the file on, on the displaced. And they really felt they were not a priority. It would not be a priority as long as there was such an international focus on forging a deal with, with Haftar. Ima, do you want to speak to the external actors? I mean, Perhaps answering some of what the gentleman asked. No, I mean, obviously, in terms of external actor, they, they play a detrimental role. If you're in a, I'm pretty sure, Chris, having attended a few meetings, can attest to the fact that even some Libyan that are sent to represent supposedly their party's interests or whatever go out and break uh, during the break and be phone call on phone calls with Emirati, Egyptian, XYZ officials. They don't exactly represent national interests, which I think is a, is a problem. And this, I think, is also the, the Khalifa Haftar blueprint of being a, a conduit for foreign intervention has, I think, been attempt like there are figures that are looking at that and looking at attempting to replicate that in some way, shape or form in, 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 in West in Western Libya, basically, uh, on a, perhaps on a smaller on a smaller scale, because Haftar has his own sort of history, you want to call it charisma, if you if you like, uh, but he has a certain aura to him. And I think the other facet of this, not just the foreign intervention side, but also the generational aspect uh, of this, the taurit, like legacy planning, etc. I think you clearly see those trends also being replicated now uh, with some officials in Western Libya, which is why kind of my, my chapter also teases out this aspect, of, this generational aspect and the long term implications of that. And this, I think, is partly the, the kind of story right now in, in Eastern Libya and why a lot of a lot of people are experiencing buyer, buyer's remorse is partly because of the consolidation of the Haftar family of, of power and particularly of figures that they didn't really want in the in the broader picture, because that makes the narrative of the uh, not just the counterterrorism aspect collapse, but also the narrative of the this being a disciplined army collapse if Saddam is at its head. And you can't you can't really sustain you, you can't really sustain both both narratives if you have a modicum of, of logic and the same thing same thing in, in in western libya where you see a momentum towards familial rule with the with the Dbeiba family operating the way the way it does uh, essentially now obviously they have different methods of going about it perhaps Dbeiba is a bit less militaristic but you clearly see that there are a little bit of parallels there which i think is a, is a worrying trend Okay, and Rima, do you want to come in on that, on whether you think external actors have had a positive role, a negative role, a mixed role? Uh, I'm sorry, I don't think that uh, I can cover this uh, point of view in my, in my discussion chapter. It's a bit away from my field of view. 
Okay, well, we're coming towards the last 10 minutes or so, so perhaps a few more questions, but perhaps the panel can try to answer them more succinctly so that we get a few through. Can we do that? Yeah. Uh, the man over there in the blue shirt and who else? Uh, it's Marge Jabelli and, and Travis and Hamlins. Um, it, perhaps we try and get a positive um, answer at the end of this. Um, at the time, if you remember 2013, the language was very much it was post um, CC taken over in Egypt, and it was very much the language was kill them all, you know, it, but there was a zero sun game. It was very much they're terrorists, we need to get rid of them. And I just wonder whether the, that narrative has now changed from either side and whether um, people are realizing you can't, you know, you, you, th that's not possible anymore. Thank you. And the gentleman with the hat at the front, baseball cap. Um, hi, thank you for uh, your uh, discussion. My question for uh, both of you is uh, throughout your uh, observation, the war in uh, Benghazi uh, and the Haftar um, or the transition of power from the non state actors to groups such as Ansar Sharia, Dror, uh, to Khalifa Haftar as you know, dominant uh, actor in uh, uh, Benghazi, uh, why do you think he fight against the terrorist group? the religious group uh, in contrast now he support the salafist group and allow them to involve in the libyan national army so okay do you want to start with that because that seems like a very discreet question and then we can imagine maybe you could come in on the narrative well it, it's a very interesting question because it reminds me of conversations i've had with um people from benghazi who again supported initially the dignity operation because they understood it uh, in terms of how it was presented to them, the professed objective, this idea of a war on, on, on terrorism, a war on extremist groups. And several people have said to me since, in terms of the dominance of the Mudkali Salafist um, dynamic in the rig religious space in Benghazi, they have said to me, well, we supported dignity to ensure that, you know, what we consider to be religious uh, fundamentalists or extremists, you know, are not in the public space in Benghazi. And now we have to deal with the, the Mudkali Salafis. So this is something that a lot of people have, have raised with me and they kind of draw comparisons between the two in terms of an attempt to impose ultra conservative social norms uh, on Benghazi and a kind of a snuffing out or an attempt to snuff out uh, civil society. And I think that this also to, to go to the other question, um, you know, this, this question of, of how to solve the kind of extremism that was present in Benghazi up to May 2014, um, an extremism that, as I mentioned earlier, had deep social roots in the city. Um, people would say to me that, well, everyone knows somebody in Ansar. Um, there were Ansar al-Sharia members from every socioeconomic um, part of, of Benghazi society. Um, there were people in Ansar al-Sharia who were former uh, military officers, uh, who were teachers at international schools in, in Benghazi. So it was a very complicated social phenomenon. And as I said earlier, there was a debate in Benghazi in terms of how to, to tackle that. And most people I spoke to before May 2014 said, look, let's, the, the idea is try and peel, you know, the kind of less ideologically driven uh, members of Ansar al-Sharia, and then, of course, the irreconcilables um, would have to be tackled in a different way. And as I mentioned earlier, you know, the dignity operation, of course, tipped that um, debate over. I think now, again, going back to this idea of looking back, and it's, you know, remember, it's been almost a decade since the, the launch of, of the dignity operation. So there has been time for people to reflect on what happened. And all those people who supported dignity later had misgivings or saw how the operation was being conducted, saw the dynamics emerge that Imad has referred to earlier in terms of the Haftar family, the sons of Haftar being appointed to various military and other positions, etc., made people wonder, was this about something else entirely all the time? Which then leads some to say, well, in terms of, again, tackling this kind of extremism, should it emerge in the future, it will have to be tackled in um, in a different way, in a more sophisticated way, which was what some people were arguing anyway in the run up to the dignity operation. I don't know if that's answer your question, but I think there's 
in some quarters in Benghazi, there's a recognition that actually, to, to give an example, a couple of people I've spoken to have, have argued that Benghazi now, and these are people again who supported the dignity operation, they have argued that Benghazi now is in a worse situation as they see it than in early 2014 before the launch of the dignity operation. And that's quite an extraordinary argument to make if you supported the dignity operation. But the point they make is, yes, there were extremists uh, present in Benghazi at the time. Some people believe they were behind the assassinations and the bombings that were happening, but there were you know, several hundred of them. Whereas the, the changes we've seen happen in Benghazi are so deep in terms of the, the social changes, the demographic changes, et cetera, that this is something people will be facing the consequences of for many years to come. Okay, Imad, I'm going to give you the last word to answer the question about whether there is a, a positive, let's not kill them all narrative shifting. But before we come to that, I, I, there's a question um, in the chat for Rima. So Rima, I'm going to give you the chance to answer this and then I'll come back to you, Imad, okay? The question is from Reem Ben Jiaber. And the question is, would the panel think it's fair to say that women's engagement in the public sphere and social media is more acceptable as long as they stay in business and quote entrepreneurship? Women in the public political sphere is still problematic, isn't it? Rima, does that strike you as, as being accurate? I think um, if I want to look to my book chapter as like uh, two main pictures that can do a comparison between two situations for women in Libya is one picture that um, um, shows a woman, Libyan woman, standing in lines to get the salaries that have been laid for months uh, in public spaces. And it's uh, very acceptable. This humiliating situation is not being like criticized by any groups or, or states uh, uh, in Libya. While the other picture is that uh, Libyan woman uh, on the beach doing yoga or uh, initiative of, uh, of women uh, going through with their bikes inside public spaces. And it gets very, uh, the, some groups very concerned about women public participation. And these kind of actions, women having fun or doing sports in public is stopped right away. So today we can see these kind of activities inside um, public spaces for a woman having fun. But if we see them moving in lines or uh, to get uh, financial support to their families, it is acceptable. So uh, it's not about social media and political uh, um, participation. It's about public um, participation when it's necessary, when it's have economical value to the city, uh, society and the family. But if it doesn't bring economical value, or it doesn't support moving forward with the crisis, it's problematic. And women get threatened and sometimes stopped from doing the exercises that they think is important to them. So it's about what kind of activities doing in public or private spaces, rather than what kind of um, uh, spaces that they are in. Okay. Imad, answer the question from the gentleman. I'll, and, answer, and we'll I'll, answer, I'll try and answer both your uh, Ala and, and the gentleman's question very quickly. Um, so, it, Ala, there's a quote that says, we pass through the present with our eyes blindfolded. And I think that very much applies to, to, to Banghazi. It's kind of in retrospect now easy to experience buyer's remorse. Etc. And this, apply, this applies across the, the, the board in, in, in Libya. But I think the issue that we are currently having as, as Libyans and as a society at large is how to now contend with those legacies because there is no forum for that to happen uh, at this stage. So even if it's implicitly acknowledged that maybe we made mistakes, uh, etc., there's very little fora at this stage where those can be, that, that can be acknowledged. We sort of need a, a truth and reconciliation format uh, in Libya to be to be able to move past our, our, our contested history, even if we don't agree about everything, but at least we agree that we collectively made mistakes at some point in time. And this applies even to Baghazi Tuta, because a lot of people would tell you, yeah, the Baghazi story didn't begin in October or May 2014. It began in, in 2012, where, where, where we were abandoned, etc., by the GNC. For a lot of people, that they would they would tell you that over, over two years. And I think those are the two narratives that need to be 
need to be brought together and need to be acknowledged as as grievances of, of both of both uh, camps. Let's let's call them or a broader set of set of camps. To your question, this is where I differ a little bit with Wolfram's assessment earlier. I don't think that's what stabilized Libya is Wagner and, and Turkey being in. I think it's the broader recalibration that's happened in the region. I personally don't think it's very sustainable because they haven't resolved their underlying differences over, over much. And to be completely honest with you, I think it's a lack of means on the Libyans side or the Libyan elite side in that they can't kill everyone. They tried to, they, they can't, therefore we need another way of going about things. And in some, in some cases, since, since Khalifa Haftar has this very, it has this very imposing role over the past 10 years, I think his issues is legacy planning at this stage, which he's shifted towards essentially over the past two to three years. Whereas in, in, in Western Libya, we're seeing different dynamics between the elites in, in, in Western Libya over what the kind of elite consolidation process should and will, will look like moving forward. I don't know whether the regional calibration will, will move forward. And I also, we're kind of race, it, it would be positive if we were actually moving towards something that resembles, uh, a, I want to say a democracy or something that responds to people's aspiration. But at this stage, it's a little bit difficult to have that, that, that considering all the, all the realities. But uh, yeah, sorry to end on a, on a bleak note. But well, on yeah. that note, yeah, I think we will end. Um, apologies to those people. I know some of you had your hands up. We didn't get to you. Perhaps we'll get to it in the conversation afterwards. And apologies, Rosa Alvarez. We didn't get to your question either. Sorry. Um, thank you to the audience here in London and on Zoom. Uh, thank you to the panel, Matt Dean Badi, Mary Fitzgerald, and Reem Ibrahim. And thank you to Chatham House for organizing this. If you don't follow, the Chatham House MENA program on social media, then how are you going to know about future events and the best? It's a, it's, a, it's a puzzle. All right, ladies and gentlemen, thank you for joining us here today. Thank you all.